All right, folks, I kid you not, this is take three. We had all kinds of technical difficulties getting to the point where we're at now, so we're gonna push through. I'm not gonna edit this. Buckle up, here we go. All right, hey there, folks, how you doing today? Hope all is going well for you. Please bear with the racket you may hear in the background throughout this production. Now, this is part two of our series on the Savage Axis uh, rifle here. If you missed the first part of the video, Feel free to click on the link to that video, which is down in the description. All right, as I always like to show folks, this is a safe and empty weapon. The magazine has been removed, nothing in the chamber. There's no live ammunition out here in our workspace. This box is empty. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. So what we have here, folks, is an early edition Savage Axis rifle. This one was made before they put the AccuTrigger on the rifle, which was an improvement, although a lot of folks don't like those. For starters, I will show clear here, this is a safe and empty weapon. Notice there's no magazine, nothing in the chamber. Clear and open bolt. Right. See, hopefully, hopefully that shows up in the camera there. Seven pounds seven ounces on the first one seven pounds one ounce on the second one Seven pounds, one ounce on the third one. So we had an average of seven pounds, three ounces there. This one also has the original flimsy stock that just really feels cheap and almost too small for an adult sized shooter. More on that later as we are going to address two things that we did to the rifle today to make it better. For starters, we're gonna go back to the survey that I posted yesterday. Several of you contributed to that, thank you. The overwhelming majority of the folks that contributed wanted to see the baseline data on the rifle before I went fooling around with changing anything on it. I agree with that. I think that was the way to go. It did complicate things a little bit. Now I'm gonna hold this target up here, folks, and talk about it briefly. I will superimpose some images over this uh, while I'm talking about it in depth. But basically, we took this rifle to the range, and at 100 yards, we fired five different types of ammunition through it. We made some marks here for a witness on the sides of the plastic stock to help ensure that we had it lined up to the same spot for each subsequent shot. In addition to a awkwardly heavy trigger pull, we've got quite a bit of side to side wiggle in this trigger also. Starting with Monarch 150 grain full metal jacket steel cased ammo, some, I think it was Federal 762 NATO ammo, some 150 grain Remington UMC ammo, some Federal non typical whitetail 150 grain ammo. That was this one right here. And down here we had a 168 grain Sierra Match King hand load that I did not develop for this rifle. This was a load that I've used in my other 308 with some good results. We'll talk about that more here in a minute. And then just so there's no confusion, the group down here on the lower right hand side was the second group fired with that ammunition because I didn't want any interference with that low shot group right there. So now, uh, 
onto the PowerPoint. If you look up here at the top, you'll see that this first group, which is identified with these green pasties here, was about two and a half inches. That was fired with the Monarch 308 uh, steel case stuff. And you'll notice that that group w was significantly to the right. So much so that instead of moving over to the other upper target, I moved on over to the second target on the left hand side to fire my second group, which also was far enough to the right that I decided to make an adjustment to the scope before moving on. And I realize my markings are kind of hard to read there, but the second group that I fired was about three and a half inches and that was with Remington UMC 150 grain full metal jackets. Moving on to our 7.62 NATO stuff, after making an adjustment to the scope, it did seem to correct the shooting to the right and we almost took it a little too far to the left. But you'll see here that we were at three and a quarter inches with that initial group. So then I moved on to the Federal 150 grain non-typical whitetail ammunition, which shot a group best of the day before making any modifications to the rifle. The group was 1.75 inches and pretty well centered. It was definitely minute of deer at that range. Or moving on down to our final group before making the modifications to the rifle with my 168 grain Sierra Match King hand loads. Now while the group was pretty well centered, it was not a particularly good group and had a spread of about three inches. So moving on from there, I took the rifle apart at the range because of you people. Yes, it's your fault. I took the rifle apart at the range to install the M Carbo Savage Axis Trigger Spring Kit. Now while I could probably get away with it, I don't want to chance it here on the tube of you, and I'm not going to show you how I installed the Trigger Spring Kit from M Carbo on this rifle nor am I going to show you how to install the 3D printed blocks in the fore end of the stock to help stiffen it up. Also, I am not going to bother showing how that was done on our Rumble channel, and there is a reason for that. For starters, with the Trigger Spring Kit, M Carbo has a very good video for that on their website. When you go to their website, to the place where they sell the spring kit, in the item description, there is a link to a video that shows you just how to do this, and it could not be more simple. Furthermore, installing the 3D printed plastic blocks in the fore end to stiffen it up, if you can't figure that one out on your own, folks, you need to go back to this. Moving on to our second set of shots, say that three times fast, I decided to start with the Sierra Match Kings because I wanted to give them a fair shake with a cool barrel. I fired the three rounds within about two minutes, letting the rifle cool down probably about 30-45 seconds in between shots, and we managed to reduce the group size from three inches down to just under an inch and a half. You'll also notice a significant difference in point of impact. I think that has to do with the little blocks that we installed in the forend. The second group that I shot was this group up here, which was the Federal Non-Typical Whitetail. And you'll see here that we had a reduction from 1.75 inches down to about 1.25. So again, a fairly significant improvement. Moving on up here to our 7.62 NATO ammunition. Our group size improved from 3.25 inches down to 2.75. And I really kind of feel like that one up there was just me. I didn't feel good about that shot after I took it. Moving on from there, we went back to our Monarch 308 ammunition. And Lord have mercy. I'm not sure what happened there, folks, but I can assure you that was just me. I've been sneezing and coughing because of all the pollen coming out of our oak trees here lately. And I was trying to stifle some kind of gag reflex at the time that I pulled the trigger there. It wasn't good, it wasn't pretty. I didn't have enough ammunition with me to reshoot that group, so there you have it. 
because that group was so low and so bad, I didn't want to confuse anything from that group with our second group shot with the Remington UMC ammunition, so I moved down here. And our group with the Remington UMC improved from about three and a half inches down to two and a quarter inches. So I said all that to say this. While none of those are particularly stellar groups, it tells us a lot. As you can see here. Okay, so now that we have the M Carbo trigger kit installed here, first I'll show you that now it's hard to see here, I realize, but while there's still a little bit of side to side play, it is drastically reduced from what we had initially. And now we'll take three trigger pulls. Our first one there, try to show that to you, 4.27. Store that one, reset the bolt. Three pounds, 12 ounces. And four pounds, two ounces. So that gives us, if you look there, the average of those three shots is just over four pounds, down from well over seven. Installing the M Carbo trigger spring and shim kit on this rifle really improved the way the trigger feels. And as you could see from that last little clip there, it also reduced the uh, trigger pull weight significantly. While I didn't do the math, it seems like probably about a 40% reduction. So that's good. That's, that's, uh, that's what we were wanting there. Moving back to my hand load with the Sierra Match Kings, while 1.5 MOA is not good for a hand load, that load was not designed for this rifle. I have not done anything to tweak that load, and all of the components that I used were several years old. I don't really think that has anything to do with it, but suffice it to say, I will be experimenting some more in the future to try to improve what we've got here. Another factor that I'll add into this equation was at no time really, with the exception of the time it took to replace the trigger spring and to insert the blocks in the fore end, did we stop and allow this rifle to cool down? I, I wasn't shooting it as fast as I could, but all of the groups were shot within five minutes of each other. So the rifle was never smoking hot, but it was never cool once we got started. So with all that being said, what do I think of the M Carbo trigger spring and shim kit? Best 20 bucks I could have spent on this rifle. What do I think of the little stock blocks that I put in the front? Hmm, it does seem like it stiffened it up a little bit this way. I don't see as it did anything side to side. You can still bump that flimsy plastic stock on the barrel, and I don't like that. But when you think back to our first video on the series, we're actually planning on doing a stock swap on this rifle at a later date. And I think probably that's still going to happen. Now one other thing that I will add to this is the scope on this rifle is a Vortex Diamondback. Now it's an earlier Vortex Diamondback. This one was purchased new by the guy that had the rifle before me back in 2017. This scope does not have a parallax adjustment on it. And compared to the latest and greatest Vortex Diamondback scopes, it does seem to be a mite primitive. Now with that being said, before I got a chance to take the rifle to the range. I had the rifle in a soft case sitting in the corner of the living room and my daughter's cat ran by full speed like he normally does when taking that corner and did not see the big blue case sitting in front of him and he hit it and knocked the rifle over. After that occurred while I was taking the initial readings of the trigger pull before I went to the range with this rifle, I had the rifle standing in the corner and it got bumped and fell over on the cement floor right on the scope. There's a little scuff right there on the, on the uh, adjustment cover that I'll zoom in on so you can see it. So the rifle hit the ground twice 
once in a padded case and once just the bare rifle on the bare concrete. And neither of those seemed to do anything to affect the function of the scope because we fired many rounds after that occurred and there wasn't any significant change in impact or anything that would indicate that something got knocked loose in the scope. So I, I will say that for the scope. I've busted scopes before doing less than that to them. So I think this one probably is a good scope. It would not have been the scope that I would have selected for this rifle and we may change it out in the future to something with a higher magnification because I do plan on doing some distance work with this rifle once I get everything else figured out on it. So what's going to be next for the rifle? Well, I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm going to either Cerakote the barrel and the action or Dura-Blue the barrel and the action. Uh, I'm going to leave that up to y'all. I'm going to post a poll over here on the channel and you can pick either option A, which would be Cerakote, or option B, which would be Dura-Blue. And uh, depending on how that one works out, I'll give it about a week and then we'll move on from there. One other thing that I will cover here that seems slightly relevant, so I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it uh, just because one of y'all may encounter this in the future. The only reliability issues that I have encountered with this rifle so far was with the Monarch brand steel cased ammunition, twice we had light primer strikes. I'll show you an image of that here so you can see what those rounds look like. Now, both rounds did go off when I put them back in the rifle and ran them through again, but just something to be aware of. Those particular rounds were not really made for a hunting rifle. They're made more for something semi-automatic with a floating firing pin. And that's why they put those heavy primers on them. And as I didn't have any issues with any of the other ammunition through the rifle, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that this particular rifle does not like that Monarch steel cased ammunition and leave it at that. So without wasting any more of your time, I'm going to let you go for now. But as always, take care. Thanks. God bless.